So hello, uh, my name is Rafael Medina. Uh, I'm associate professor at uh, the Department of Infectious Diseases uh, and Immunology in Catholic University in Chile. And today I would like to uh, share with you some of the data that we have been producing for the last seven years or so as, as we have developed a human cohort to try to really understand in depth um, pathogenesis of uh, human influenza viruses. And uh, I'd like to share with you some of the new systems virology approaches that we have been using, because uh, our main goal uh, is to try to understand global phenomenon and from there move on into uh, dissecting molecular factors that affect uh, disease outcome. So just as a brief background, um, I would like to sh uh, share these uh, ideas with you that I think will make, make sense to a lot of us as we uh, look at some of the recent phenomenon with inf emerging infectious diseases uh, and the, their potential for causing outbreaks and pandemics. So, of course, you have um, on the um, uh, right-hand side of your screen uh, 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 some um, natural reservoirs and ecological niches that uh, can affect or influence the emergence of, uh, of uh, some of these infectious diseases. Therefore, you can see that there is physical, environmental, and climate change factors that might induce uh, potential diseases as for some of the samples that we have seen with influenza itself, uh, but also with Ebola, Zika, and chikungunya in the last uh, few years. Uh, now, in regards to how this uh, potential emerging infectious disease can affect, affect us, humans, as hosts, we also know that there are some people that are more susceptible to becoming infected with some of these diseases. And in this regard, there are several factors that one can take into account. Uh, one of them is cultural, how we perceive some of these infectious diseases in nature. Uh, there are political issues, economical issues, the capacity of uh, health systems, but also uh, the hosts themselves. In, uh, for example, elderly uh, children and uh, pregnant women uh, are known to be susceptible to some diseases, and this in particular is true for influenza viruses. But there's also a number of uh, what we think are healthy uh, individuals that can also become susceptible uh, to infectious diseases and even uh, die or have a very severe disease. And there are factors and molecular factors that are currently unknown of why this happens. And now if we move uh, more into uh, some of the uh, molecular factors that are into place, uh, of course, there's a plethora of different phenomenon that we can look at. Uh, some of this uh, could be the virus itself. This is what we do with influenza virus in our group. Uh, but also there is uh, pre-existing conditions and comorbidities, uh, clinical profiles uh, of the individuals that uh, become infected. Um, now there is also a big push to trying to understand uh, other factors that coexist with that, which is the microbiome, for example, which we have been looking at. But uh, I don't have time to talk to you about this today. Uh, and also uh, there is genetic uh, susceptibilities, so uh, certain genes that might allow uh, certain factors to be triggered or not to be triggered uh, that are necessary to combat infectious diseases. And uh, a big portion which I put there in the middle is how the host immune responses uh, that we generate uh, upon infection uh, help us uh, to uh, clear the virus but in many cases, uh, we have been learning that uh, immune responses also can contribute to uh, disease severity. And I'll try to talk a little bit about that in my talk to show you what we have been doing in that regard. So uh, I'll tell you two stories, which I think uh, summarize some of the things that we have been doing and uh, to show you how the different uh, tools that we have been uh, using to, to understand uh, this is the very outcome and host factors that uh, are at play. So again, our primary goal of my group is to perform systematic and comprehensive analysis of factors contributing to this is severity. And like I said, uh, some of the factors that we have been looking at and I will tell you today is uh, influenza virus phenotypes and genotypes and how we think this can actually influence uh, disease severity. And we also will be talking a little bit about host immune responses and how they also play a role in uh, disease outcome. So um, 
this is uh, to show you what uh, uh, the seasonal influenza virus uh, epidemiology looks in Chile, and uh, this is showing you the uh, last five years. And as you can see, uh, the different colors uh, uh, depict the different uh, seasonal strains that circulate in the population over the year. Um, with the uh, light blue here showing the H1N1 seasonal influenza virus, the red shows the uh, H3N2 seasonal influenza virus, the green shows the uh, uh, influenza B. Uh, and yellow is uh, some of the unsub type uh, viruses that occur every season because uh, as most uh, health systems, uh, you don't really um, subtype every, you know, 100% of the viruses that circulate. But you can help get a very nice trend of what was the predominant strain and how the different peak of uh, cases uh, occur every year. Uh, I'd like to highlight, for example, in this current year, 2019, we had a, a very strong peak of H1N1 uh, uh, circulation, but as we just are finishing now our season, uh, which is a very late uh, finishing of our season here, we had a, a very strong peak of influenza B um, in the springtime, really. So this is just to uh, kind of emphasize that influenza virus can circulate in uh, naive populations uh, at pretty much any time during the year. And it's got to do probably uh, because of susceptibility and lack of immune responses to uh, potential viruses that circulate um, every year. So as I said, we have been developing a, a systems uh, biology uh, approach to understand uh, this virus. And what we have developed uh, with the uh, collaboration of our clinicians here at the University Hospital is to perform a, a longitudinal study where we uh, recruit patients that have uh, acute infections that come into the hospital. And uh, then we consent them and uh, ask them to join the, the, the clinical um, uh, investigation that we do. And we take um, uh, several samples uh, in order to understand immune responses and also in order to understand virus. So as you can see there, uh, in the acute phase, um, we take samples uh, of uh, blood samples, which are the red uh, little uh, uh, rectangles there on day one uh, or upon um, recruitment, and then also a convalescent phase uh, sample on day 28. So we use this uh, 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 serum and blood samples to understand uh, seroconversion, but also to understand cytokine responses uh, early on and later on during the disease. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, the green boxes there uh, also show the nasopharyngeal sw swaps that we take um, from these patients. And this allows us to follow the virus over the first uh, seven days of infection. And the first idea of that, uh, and which I will show you in, in the second part, is to try to understand whether the virus changes over time. Now, as I'm listing here in the bottom, these are all the different assays that we can actually do and perform, try to understand in a global way how influenza virus affects uh, the immune response at the antibody level, uh, cytokine response, of course, this, uh, as I said, um, is um, how the infection is being controlled or not uh, early on and during the convalescent phase of the infection. Now, new techniques allow us as well to perform uh, more um, in-depth studies, uh, and, and we're moving into this. Uh, I'm not sh going to show you any of this uh, for now, but uh, we're conducting some uh, single-cell analysis to try to understand uh, how uh, um, uh, the expression of different um, profiles from uh, severe and non-severe individuals can allow us to differentiate what global uh, networks are being um, triggered during infection. And you know, the same thing we do with RNA-seq uh, by just performing an overall uh, global uh, transcriptomic analysis of these samples. Uh, on the top there, you can also see that the nasal swabs, we uh, isolate the viruses, we subtype them, and we do full genome sequencing from all the viruses that we take, uh, we obtain from these patients. And uh, together with the clinical metadata that we obtain from, from the same uh, cohort, we are able to do uh, what we call is a high dimensional multi-scale network analysis that allow us to pinpoint not only to specific genes, but to networks and to uh, global responses that then allow us to make hypotheses uh, based on uh, a very uh, in-depth analysis of uh, a lot of data. That's, that's 
this, uh, what I think is, or what we think is the power of our um, cohort and our analysis uh, platform. So I'll tell you a uh, first uh, uh, set of studies that we have done with patients uh, from uh, 2011 to 2017, where here in this table I'm showing you um, uh, that uh, we have obtained data from 93 severe patients, um, uh, sorry, 93 non-severe patients and 129 severe patients. And here I'm just showing you the demographics of this cohort. Um, but the main thing to point out is that we have uh, certain comorbidities that we have been seeing in the past that seem to be predominant in people that are becoming very severe. Uh, and in our particular cohort uh, here in Chile, uh, we're finding that uh, hypertension, chronic cardiovascular disease, and also obesity uh, are predominant comorbidities of these uh, people that are becoming severe. Um, in the past, um, obesity has been shown to be a risk factor uh, for uh, severe influenza disease. Uh, but uh, as far as we understand, um, this will be uh, one of the first studies showing uh, that arterial hypertension has a, a, a big role uh, to play in regards to severity in, in, in influenza patients. Um, another important thing to note is that uh, our cohort uh, does not have any specific bias or discrimination. So we use uh, samples from patients that are recruited from all ages. Um, and um, we can also say that uh, in regards to the severe patients, it seems that the males are uh, more severe, at least in our, in our cohort, about 59% of the severe patients are, uh, of ma uh, are male. Um, and uh, we, in this particular cohort, we only have a two two or three patients really to that have become uh, uh, succumbed to infection that were that died due to infection. Uh, so here I'm showing you the first set of data that we can uh, extrapolate out of uh, cytokine expression profiles. So to do this, what we do is to run a, a multiplex analysis of 18 cytokines and chemokines that we know are important during uh, acute phase and uh, convalescent phase of infection in influenza-specific um, uh, cohorts. So the first thing that we do, this is an unsupervised analysis where we ask um, um, our bioinformaticians, uh, can we group first uh, samples uh, due to how similar they are to each other? So that's why it is an unbiased. We are not telling them where they come from or, or what day they were taking, but just can we uh, do an analysis where we can just group samples that look closer to each other. And then on top of that, we start uh, putting some colors into this, uh, into this data. Uh, as first of all, we look at subtype and here you can see that there are squares and triangles that uh, show uh, whether a sample uh, came from a patient infected with an H1 and 1 virus or an H3 and 2, and 2 virus. And as you can see, there's not particular trend of group to what subtypes these viruses, uh, these patients were infected with. Now, what is interesting, if we color now when the samples were taken, so these are blood samples in which we, we did a, a cytokine analysis, uh, we can actually start seeing very nice trends. As you can see, uh, uh, day zero, which will mean uh, the day when the uh, samples were taken uh, uh, upon the original um, consent, so at the time of, con of consent, uh, they cluster together uh, and form a very nice cluster of yellow uh, um, uh, cytokines that, that are, uh, are being expressed early on during infection. The opposite, if the more purple uh, you have is, is later time points during infection. So you can also see that the more purple uh, uh, samples or cytokines in this case uh, are grouping together. What is interesting about this is now if we look at the specific arrows, these are the most predominant cytokines that are being expressed in, this, in these patients. So very early on, you can see that, for example, IL-10, IP-10, IL-6, and IL-10 are becoming predominant uh, cytokines that are being expressed early on during infection. And then we have some other cytokines such as, such as uh, IL-4, IL-13, 
uh, there are uh, seem to be uh, overexpressing at later time points. Uh, so this uh, is very nice because it allows us, without uh, putting any bias into an analysis, to know what cytokines are being triggered early on. Uh, and how they compare to cytokines uh, that are been then triggered later on. But also it allowed us to uh, discriminate uh, what is the time point that we can consider early on versus the time point that we consider uh, a, a post-infection. And that particular uh, time point was set at day 14. So uh, this an analysis told us that anything that we can look at day 14 or onwards, we can actually group them as early time points, which will give us statistically uh, significant analysis. Now, if we look at the um, uh, at these particular time points, uh, so acute phase samples, what we ask, can we uh, predict uh, uh, some certain cytokines that will allow us to uh, tell that this will be markers associated with severity early on? And uh, in the same way, can we predict uh, by markers any uh, cytokine that will be associated with uh, decreased uh, infection or decreased severity um, early on? So as you can see here, um, uh, we have very uh, very nice data and clean data uh, telling us that uh, IL-6 and IL-8 will be uh, early predictors associated with increased severity. In the other hand, um, we have interferon gamma, which was uh, associated as a, a molecular factor being uh, associated with decreased severity. So this is an interesting uh, set of results because uh, we could potentially take an early sample from patients and try to predict whether this particular patient early on will be uh, 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 the chances of this person of having uh, severe disease or not according to these particular cytokines. That's, so that's, that's one potential application of some of this analysis. Uh, I have to tell you that this is still predominant preliminary data and we're moving on to more sophisticated integrative analysis to try to confirm that these uh, uh, are the case. Okay, so now I'd like to show you um, analysis of samples that we have uh, uh, from non-acute phase uh, um, uh, time points which, like I said before, these are uh, samples taken uh, on day 14 or, or after uh, the onset of symptoms. So as you can see here, uh, we had determined uh, a different set of uh, cytokines that were associated with severe disease, such as IL-8, TNF-alpha, IL-12, IL-10, and IP-10, among others. And we also get some um, um, cytokines that are uh, associated with decreased severity, such as IL-13, IL-1-beta, and IL-13. Uh, what is interesting about this is that if you, uh, from a temporal point of view, if you take into account that uh, a usual influenza infection takes about seven days, uh, um, this means that uh, even after seven days, uh, there is a lot of uh, um, immune responses that might actually be, modu be modulating uh, disease severity. So this is something that we're continuing to analyze uh, further. So here I want to show you some of the uh, global analysis that we can actually do uh, with the same data. And uh, here is a summary slide where we can put together uh, a number of different um, uh, parameters that we can measure. So first on the, on the um, uh, right-hand side, or um, we can see the risk uh, groups. Um, and as you can see, the red are uh, people that don't have risk uh, uh, in particular. Sorry, the, the red are people that are, have risk in regards to age. This means uh, uh, children under two years of age or uh, elderly, which are above 65 years of age. Then we have uh, a number of different comorbidities that we assess. Uh, and one thing that is interesting to highlight there is that the, we can see in the severe group, which is the bottom panels, uh, that arterial hypertension and cardiovascular disease are overrepresented in our cohort. Uh, again, I, as I said, this will be uh, uh, the first time that this has been described um, uh, for uh, as a risk factor for flu severity. And uh, also on the on the uh, uh, on the other side, we can see the cytokine uh, expression levels and. As I, I said before, um, we can see a number of the cytokines such as IL-8, IL-6, IL-10, and IP-10 being representative or overrepresented in the severe groups. Another interesting factor is now if we consider vaccine status, 
for some of these uh, uh, patients, we see that some patients that are very severe uh, have been vaccinated and some have not been vaccinated. Hence, uh, we believe that uh, if uh, patients have susceptibility, which are, have to do with age or specific comorbidities, uh, people can still get infected and also uh, uh, develop a very severe disease. So the role of, of understanding uh, better the role of vaccine in this population, I think is a high priority for future research. Now, uh, I want to move to the next phase, which is uh, what about the virus? I mean, now, if we study the virus, can we also associate some of the factors that might be actually responsible because of viral uh, genotypes or virulence factors that we can find there? So we have actually uh, done a, a different analysis with a group of samples uh, obtained from different patients that are severe. Um, this is a study that has been performed by a graduate student in which we use uh, samples from 27, 25 patients, uh, from patients that range from nine months old to 76 years of age. And um, a number of these were hospitalized and uh, uh, met our criteria of being severe, which means hospitalized for more than 48 hours or by being in a, a critical care unit. And as in the previous study, uh, we also find that uh, obesity, immunosuppression, and cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, are common comorbidities in these groups. Um, here, I just want to show you um, now when we do a very simple analysis. So what we do, um, uh, I'll actually go back to the previous slide. Um, I'm going to show you data from these uh, uh, patients and where all of the samples from these patients have been sequenced, uh, uh, their entire genome. And in some cases, uh, or most of the cases, we have been able to, like I said, we take swaps from different time points. So uh, we have been able to obtain full genomes from different time points of the, during the acute phase of infection. So um, this allows us to follow the virus to understand whether the virus has mutated or has acquired any mutations over the, the, the course of infection. And like I said, the, most of these patients are very severe, including some uh, two patients on, on the bottom here that uh, succumb to infection. So um, the as you can see, um, there is uh, not particular bias on, on, a, on, on age or uh, gender in this group. So uh, we think that uh, this analysis uh, contributes to uh, uh, for us to understand uh, what happens with the virus during the acute infection in severe individuals. Now, if we do um, the a simple analysis, which is just to ask by uh, uh, what is called a phylogenetic analysis, and this is an unrooted uh, analysis, which means that we are not telling them uh, how to uh, group with each other, but how they, they, will, they will actually uh, group by how similar they are to each other. We find that most samples that we are able to sequence sequentially um, over time from the same patient uh, are joined together. And here I'm, I'm kind of, I have highlighted them with bars uh, on, the, on the sides. Uh, as you can see, uh, where we have done analysis for the uh, hemagglutinin, uh, the DHA segment four, and the nanorminidase segment six. Uh, but as I'm showing here with the arrows, in certain cases, we can see a couple of samples that come from the same individual but actually that they don't group together, but they group with different uh, viruses, meaning that those viruses are actually not closer related to each other, but they seem to be uh, 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 diverging apart. Okay, so this is uh, just a, a, a representation of how these viruses can be uh, actually found to be different within the same in individual. So the question is, uh, what is different about them? So we did uh, uh, um, an extensive analysis of some of these samples and uh, look at the uh, uh, databases to see how some of the mutations that we can find in these viruses, whether there are common mutations found on the databases, whether they're moderately common or rare, or they are actually very rare. And with this, we um, did some studies about the frequency of each of the positions and where they lie within the uh, influenza genome. So we do this uh, 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 long analysis, and what I'm showing you here on the, on the top is uh, what we, a representation of the hemagglutinin analysis that we do. Um, in the um, uh, what we see here in, in the peaks that we see in the graph on the on the top is how variable these regions are in the database, and the little bars on the bottom of that 
show you where we find mutations of our cohort. So um, as you can see, they are spread out pretty much all throughout the molecule. And on the bottom of that, we, we have highlighted the functional sites that are known for influenza, such as the receptor binding site or the antigenic sites. So here we can actually start seeing where some of the mutations lie within the genome. And at the bottom, we're also now mapping this, the particular mutations that we find from our patients in crystal structures. Um, and as you can see, again, um, uh, just taking a first look, it, it's, it looks like uh, mutations can occur in different places. Now, if we, with this structural analysis, we'll go back into the analysis of frequency, how frequent these uh, sequences are represented in databases, we find that some of these sequences are common. Uh, the ones that are in light blue. Some of them are unique and uh, to uh, our patients, but that have been also been, uh, shown or been present in some uh, sequences reported in NCBI. And the yellow uh, mutations are some of the mutations that uh, have not been uh, shown in NCBI before, and it seems to be uh, unique to the patients that we have analyzed in this study. So we do a similar analysis uh, for DNA. Um, again, the, we, we, we show you on, on the top the frequency of the variation seen on the on NCBI. The bars represent the different mutations that we find in our cohort. As you can see, some of them are grouped. So there seems to be regions that are very variable, which is not, uh, uh, it, is, it is expected. Uh, and again, the, the functional sites, uh, we put them there and then we map them in the crystal structure and looked at some of the mutations that are unique. So we're actually interested in trying to understand some of the unique mutations in our cohort because um, we hypothesize that they will, will allow us to tell whether some of the mutations might have contributed to uh, disease uh, severity. Um, so here I'm showing you some of the summaries uh, of uh, the same analysis that, that we have done for all the genes. Uh, and just to highlight that uh, this is not uh, a phenomenon that only occurs in the uh, glycoproteins, which are the surface proteins of the viruses, uh, uh, of the virus, but also occurs on the internal genes. So uh, it seems like the influenza virus, since it doesn't have a, a, a neural uh, correction uh, capacity in, in their um, polymerase, uh, it can actually make mutations uh, throughout the genome. Uh, but we have also started looking at some of the mutations that we think are interesting because uh, it shows, for example, mutations that have changed from one day to the next, but that were uh, obtained from the same individual, which will mean that the virus actually uh, had a transition and a mutation uh, within um, a day or two in the same host. And that's, for example, highlighted here in PV1 uh, with the red residue, uh, the methionine that changed within two, uh, three days to uh, leucine. A similar scenario we have seen uh, in HA and NA, and these are the two cases that I want to show you whether we have followed up and done functional analysis and, and, and found some interesting results. So uh, here HA and NA are actually expected to have a lot of changes. Uh, this is what has been seen in, in the databases and in nature in general. These are prone, uh, these are genomes that are prone to change because of uh, uh, immune selection pressure uh, and also uh, because of other uh, um, adaptations that they need to do in order to, uh, to have a functional replication of the virus. But I want to point you to this uh, 118 uh, uh, mutation. There is a glutamine here that is highlighted um, and also in the case of NA, I would like to show you and point you to this uh, isoleucine 223 two, mutation in the neuroimmunities that occurs in two separate patients um, that uh, we think have a functional activity uh, and they might actually contribute to infection severity. So here I'm, I'm showing you a slide that summarizes all the transitional changes that we have found in different patients. As I'm showing here on the top, even with patient three from 2011, we have two mutations that have, are not really uh, in any of the, the previously described functional sites, but there are these are mutations that change uh, you know, within four days. So that means that on, on a particular day, we found one mutation and then four, later, four day, days later, that mutation was fixed uh, at a different, uh, you know, with a different amino acid. One of those mutations is this uh, mutation in, in residue 223. 
which is uh, actually close and, and, and within uh, the catalytic side of the neuraminidase activity of the protein. And this, uh, we see a transition from a methionine to a, an isolucine. So the isolucine is actually the wild type original uh, um, uh, amino acid in that position. So it will be the methionine that actually changed. And I will show you in a minute uh, what we think was happening in there. So we see other changes in other patients that some of them, again, fall within functional sites. But I want to also highlight uh, patient 25 at the bottom here where, where he, um, the residue number uh, 180 uh, falls right in the middle of antigenic site SA. And again, this it has a transition from a lysine to a glutamine within three days uh, uh, from in the same patient. So again, if I show you the uh, where patient three, so the original uh, neuraminidase mutation, mutation that I've been describing comes from, uh, this is um, a patient that uh, had immune uh, 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 had cancer, had neurological disease, and had immune suppression. Uh, so this is uh, a 12-year-old um, male that was uh, um, um, that had influenza for several days. So if we look at this particular patient, um, as you can see now, uh, the, the course of infection, uh, the original set of symptoms uh, came a few days later. After, uh, um, after he was hospitalized for other reasons. And then uh, uh, once he was confirmed as uh, uh, influenza positive, then he got two rounds of uh, the antiviral osultamavir, which is the uh, commonly used virus, uh, antiviral. Uh, the samples that we uh, actually analyzed and, and observed this, this change was taken on day uh, 12 after the onset of symptoms from flu. So this, this patient had a very prolonged infection from, from influenza, and uh, uh, four days later, we took another sample uh, and we found uh, some changes. So here in the molecule I'm on, 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 on panel B, I'm showing you where this mutation falls, and it falls right in the middle of the catalytic side. And we think that this particular mutation changes from a methionine to isoleucine. And in fact, the methionine uh, is a different residue that actually might interact and, and get in the way of the catalytic side. So if we look at this closer, uh, in fact, we find that this uh, methionine uh, might actually have a steric hindrance in regards to the uh, action of, of sultamary because it will prevent it uh, at least to fully um, uh, insert into the pocket of the catalytic side. Now on D, I'm showing you uh, what we found when we this virus. So as I said, found that the predominant of the viruses sequenced by Illumina had the methionine, which would be the what we think was uh, a resistant uh, um, uh, mutation to osultamavir, and only a little bit of uh, the original wild type um, uh, isolation. Day 16, once the osultamavir, the second round of osultamavir was uh, terminated or, or had ended, uh, we can see a reversion to the original uh, isoleucine, which is the, uh, the wild type uh, genotype. So in order to determine whether there was a, a true uh, resistant mutation, we did a two. The first was to do uh, start analysis, which actually it allows us to, to tell whether the neuraminidase activity of these two different viruses, the one with the methionine versus the isoleucine, had a different um, inhibitory concentration 50. And uh, we had uh, a result that told us that there was at least two to three, four um, higher IC50 in the um, methionine viruses uh, than the wild type virus, meaning that this could actually be a potential resistant phenotype. Uh, and then to confirm that, what we did was to run a competition analysis where we actually rescued this virus by reverse genetics and co-infected cells in the presence or absence of osultamavir at different um, concentrations of the drug. And as you can see in the first panel, uh, where it was, there was no osultamavir, pretty much the two viruses uh, were um, found at, at similar frequencies uh, when we looked at these infections by um, 
Illumina, and we passage these viruses three times in cells under the same conditions. Now, uh, as you can see, uh, we use one micromolar, 10 micromolar, and 100 micromolar of oseltamivir. So we see uh, those dependent uh, effect where the methionine actually outcompetes the isoleucine uh, virus in the presence of some oseltamivir. Therefore, this uh, uh, confirms that this uh, particular mutation is uh, and confers uh, an antiviral resistance against oseltamivir, which could also explain why this uh, individual had a prolonged infection uh, and uh, uh, a severe outcome. So the second case is this patient 25 that I mentioned. This was from a, a very young um, individual that had also been vaccinated. Um, so uh, what we think with this particular mutation, now if we look at the clinical data, um, upon the onset of on symptoms, we took two samples on day five and on day eight, and we also see this transitional change uh, from a lysine to a glutamine, and, and then you can see that uh, this is right in the middle of uh, an, anti an important antigenic site assay, which is shown here on panel A, B, sorry. Now, if we look at how this virus was represented when we do a, a, a next generation sequencing, we can see that the on day five, the virus had the wild type original um, uh, genotype with a lysine in, in that particular residue, but then on day eight, it changed to uh, the uh, what we think is the scape phenotype. Um, now, if we go back to the sequencing, uh, the sequences that are available in, in GeneBank, um, we can see that uh, at the beginning of the uh, infection with this pandemic strain, which is the H1N1 uh, pandemic strain that now circulates seasonal, seasonally, most of the uh, viruses uh, or 100% of the viruses have this lysine residue at that position up until 2012 where we start seeing some of the transitions to in this particular residue uh, to different genotypes but then from almost 2013 onwards then the q is a predominant genotype in this virus um, so that is very interesting because uh, we have uh, what we think is a phenomenon in a single patient that we can see that transition we could actually be a escape mutant virus uh, in in, a, in an individual now, if we look at what has been described uh, right at that time, if we look at this phylogenetic tree uh, in 2013 to 2014, this particular uh, K100Q uh, amino acid change was also a key determinant on how the viruses circulated over time, also indicating that this residue is probably an important residue. And in this particular uh, publication, they had also pointed out that they could, this could be an escape mutation that helped the virus overcome uh, pre existing immunity. So uh, in order to try to address this, we also did a competition uh, experiment. Again, we rescued viruses uh, containing either the uh, 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 lysine or the um, glutamine uh, uh, amino acid, and then we co-infected cells in the presence of premium sera against the lysine, so the wild type virus. So this sera, in theory, would only be able to uh, neutralize the um, acid, but not the uh, if this was uh, in fact an escape mutant. And what we can see this uh, this again, this was a, a pre-existing sera obtained from a patient that was uh, infected only with a, the a viruses that we know uh, had a, a lysine in that particular region. So we also see uh, a dose-dependent effect. Uh, with the higher titer of antibodies that we use in this co-infection, we start seeing the predominance of the Q virus um, in the course of a, of a single infection. So again, this uh, also strongly suggests that this particular mutation is an escape mutant. Uh, so uh, this would be a potential antigenic drift mutant in a particular patient that had uh, uh, been vaccinated before. So to summarize, um, we think that these low frequency mutations uh, are have higher variability, variability in some cases uh, and could actually explain some of the disease outcome. Um, and some of the these mutations, as one would expect, most of them are located in the surface. 
And uh, I think what is interesting is that from the clinical uh, isolates that we have, if we're able to follow uh, these viruses over time, we find some functional important uh, mutations that in this case were present in the neuraminidase and also in the uh, hemagglutinin um, uh, proteins. And that could actually be um, uh, some of the reasons why these people uh, were infected for prolonged periods of time and were also severe. So with that, and I, I hope I have showed you um, some of the analysis that we are done in a systems way with human data that we can actually use for understanding molecular factors that uh, uh, can modulate influenza disease severity. So with this, I'll just finish up uh, um, uh, acknowledging uh, my group uh, and the different people that have participated in the studies our clinical group at Catholic University here in Chile, um, uh, many of our clinicians and nurses that have uh, contributed to uh, recruiting patients and obtaining clinical data, as well as uh, some of these studies that have been done in close collaborations with uh, the Icahn School of Medicine, with Dr. Adolfo Garcia Sastre, Harman Bacon, Florian Kramer, and also with uh, the J. Craig Venter Institute, Chris Dupont, uh, Dave Wentworth when he was there, and a number of other people. Um, ongoing collaborations we are actually doing with uh, uh, John Laurent Casanova and some uh, other people at the University of Singapore where uh, we are uh, continuing to do some uh, long-term analysis of influenza and other viruses. And of course, the funding that uh, comes from many different sources. Some of this funding comes from Chile uh, through different uh, grants to the uh, National Commission of Science and Technology and also from NIH through the Sears Network, uh, the Crips Center, uh, and also from uh, Fluomics Consortium uh, funded by NAID. And with that, I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much.